Okay. I think we have it figured out, folks. I <laughs> finally, I am Melissa Schreiner. I really apologize for the technical difficulties. I just got two screens and I'm clearly, I have not learned how to use them yet. So thank you for hanging with me. I promise it's worth it. This the slideshow is going to go over desert insects in the American Southwest and it will be a it'll be a sampling of what we have. Um, we've got a lot of slides for you talking about some amazing insects and arthropods, but I of course couldn't cover everything in the American Southwest. So I just I picked what I found really interesting and I am looking forward to sharing it with you today. So I want to acknowledge that some, you know the area that we're going to be discussing insects from um, originally was land that belonged to many different tribes of indigenous um, Native Americans. So I just wanted to say that, you know, we recognize that these folks were the original stewards of this land. And um, we have an acknowledgement here at Colorado State that we recognize the indigenous peoples as the original stewards. And as these words in this acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties of those nations to those traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. We, we see you, we hear you, and um, I just, I feel like it's important to acknowledge that. Let's see here. So, so today I'm gonna to be talking about first desert ecosystems and then collecting insects and arthropods in the desert. And then I'll go through a series of different groups that I've selected certain individuals from. We'll be going through Hymenoptera. I'm not going to talk about bees today, but we will discuss ants and wasps. We'll discuss the order Orthoptera, so grasshoppers, katydids, crickets, Coleoptera. We'll go through some beetles. We've got Megaloptera and Neuroptera. Those are um, insect orders I find many folks know very little about. Um, and they're some of the coolest arthropods out there. So. Get excited, and lastly, we'll um, we'll go over arachnids and insects that are associated with cacti. So, desert ecosystems are incredibly diverse, and if you've ever been to the desert, you you may know this already. But I I wanted to point out that the the deserts of the American Southwest. Um, this is a map that shows them. We've got the the Great Basin, the the Javi Desert, the Sonoran Desert, the Chihuahuan Desert here. And it makes up a, a great portion of our, our land, of our country's landmass. It's about 10%. Um, all areas of the desert, here, let me get this out of my way so I can read my slide. Um, they can be, they can be hot and cold. They contain lakes, rivers, many thousands of different types of native plants. Um, I would say that the, the boundary lines for the American, you know, Southwest is, you know, the Sierra Nevadas out, out west of us and uh, the Southern Rockies, which we, we do have um, here in Colorado. And I don't believe it, I don't know where they, where the Southern range stops on the Rockies. It may go down even farther than us. Um, but I wanted to show you here some pictures of different areas I've collected insects. This is the Pawnee Buttes. I wouldn't consider this maybe the American Southwest, but look at this ecosystem. I mean, there is tons out there to explore. Moving into the Moab area, this is now about two hours from me. Um, there is, there's a ton of diversity. We've got mesas, we have buttes in the desert. We've got a lot of river valleys. Um, this is Oak Creek Canyon out in Arizona. There were phenomenal insects in this. Um, we, we collected all afternoon. Um, we observed many dragonflies out of this river. This is north of Sedona area. And um, I've been on a trip that took me all the way through Arizona from top to bottom. And we saw many beautiful plants that insects are associated with here. This is a Theodore Roosevelt Lake. It's a massive lake and pretty much, I think it's seemed like it was pretty central Arizona um, in the Tonto Basin. So these slides are just kind of showing you a sampling of some of the different ecosystems and how diverse deserts can be. Um, this is near the Mexico border at Peña Blanca Lake, famous for dragonflies. Um, got Wil Clock, Wilcox Playa in Arizona, pretty, pretty barren out there. And, oh man, your state of New Mexico is just phenomenal for insects. Um, Cabal Lake State Park is a wonderful place to visit. If you haven't visited yet, I highly encourage you to do so. And if you even want to do some insect collecting, there is a side of that park that is not state um, 
State Park land, so you're able to collect. We've got Dawson Butte State Park. This is not necessarily the American Southwest, but it shows you some of those prairies and some of the gamble oak that we have here. Amazing insects. And this is here just right outside my new home in the Colorado National Monument. It's an amazing place to stop in if you haven't been. Got Santa Fe and sagebrush communities, juniper, you name it. There, there's something to find anywhere you look. And so I wanted to go through some pro tips of collecting or observing, if you wish, insects in the desert. So I, I created a supplies list. Um, you always want to have your collecting bag with you, have it stuff full of vials, Ziploc bags, anything you may need in the desert. Bring your charged field camera. I should have put that in there. You want to make sure it has battery life. It's the worst to end up out somewhere and finally see something you want to observe and document with your camera and you can't because it's not charged. I've been there. Don't do that. Um, make sure you have an aerial net. Um, I have one here. I'll, I'll grab it quickly. But this is my handy dandy sweet net. I have it with me all the time just to grab away. And it allows me to observe insects um, without directly handling them in my hands. It's really pretty critical to have that on me. And we'll go through PPE, um, but yeah, make sure you, um, you try to think ahead and bring everything you need to trap or observe or collect insects in the desert before you go. Um, you wanna make sure you have proper protective equipment when you are collecting insects in the desert. That means um, long sleeve, long pants you want your skin not exposed to the sun, you may think wearing a tank top is going to be cooler, but your skin temperature gets hotter when it's not covered in cloth. So you want to wear some type of sun, if you can, sunproof clothing or just clothing that's going to cover your skin. Always have your sun hat on. Um, when I'm out in the desert, I make sure I have 10 gallons of water. That's a little overkill, but if you get stuck out there, you want it. So I always, I, you know, at Walmart or wherever you can buy, you know, big camping jugs, um, of water and you can fill them up and before you go to the desert, make sure you have a source of water. Um, if you're ever doing some, you know, backwoods kind of stuff, you wanna make sure you've got a, an off-grid GPS beacon that you can either send communication to one way or have dual communication back and forth to make sure that if you, if something goes wrong, you have a way to get help. Um, go with a buddy, I highly recommend that. Um, it's more fun when you can include more people and it's safer as well. Um, you want to have some type of tool with you, a utility tool. Um, I always have my forceps to look at insects, of course. That's an important tool. But um, be always sure to tell someone where you're going. This goes for hikes. Um, this goes for when you're going on excursions into, you know, areas that can be rather dangerous like deserts. You want to make sure you tell someone when you're expected home. And if you're, if you're an overdue hiker, as we call them, um, let that person know when they should let authorities know to to go out and look for you in case something goes really wrong. So ob observing insects in the desert, some do's and don'ts. Um, I think it's important to always collect insects with the intention of observing and learning about arthropods. Um, if you're gonna donate to a museum and um, then I think it's really important to go out and look at what's there and get excited. Um, you wanna make sure that you're collecting insects on land that is legal to collect insects on. You wanna make sure you're of course not on private property unless you have granted permission. You wanna make sure you're not in a state park or in a national park. These, we are not allowed to collect insects in their, land, their lands we're preserving. Um, of course, if you have a permit, you're allowed to do that. And there's a, a system that you would go through to be able to get certain permits. Um, and I really believe you shouldn't really collect insects for sale. Um, this is a personal policy and my take on that. I think that we want to go out to the desert to learn and um, observe. So here, this is, this is some ways that you can um, approach plants to observe insects in the desert. So I'm there with Choy a, cac a cactus and it's blooming and I was taking pictures of bees this day. And note that I do have a hazard vest on so folks can see me from the road. This is along a roadside. Um, this is a friend of mine in Arizona. I think I want to say it was some type of large wasp. He was in there looking around. Um, so you want to approach plant foliage and you can, you can find many things just in, in the shade, especially in the desert. Things want to take sanctuary in certain, certain shrubs or trees. So we want to always want to be looking around. 
just like this individual is, he was looking at that yucca. There's certain yucca moths, I think, that he was looking at that were getting into the leaves. Um, but go with go with the group. It's wonderful to see and learn of, among you know young young or old scientists um, getting together out in nature is some of the best best times that you'll have. I I really think that collecting together is is a better way to go. There's aquatic insect collecting. This is me in the in the Poudre River in Fort Collins when I was in graduate school, and there's just phenomenal aquatic insects. Um, and yeah, having a type of net to collect those is it's pretty rare, but you can get very creative and just lift up rocks and see what is swimming around. It's quite interesting. There's light trapping that we can do to bring in insects that are around flying at night or maybe attracted to that UV spectrum. And you can see some amazing insects this way. I highly recommend it. If you're in an area that has little light pollution, you can see some amazing things. Visit your, your black light. So now I'm going to move into the content of this presentation and we're going to start with ants of the desert. So we're going to start with leaf cutter ants and if you haven't heard of them, this is a group of ants that they farm fungus associated with certain plants that they actually cut down and then they bring those plants back to their nest and then they culture a fungus off of them. They actually have workers that dig all the way down to the water table and they can use water even if they need to help if they need certain moisture to create a perfect um, environment for that fungus. And next to humans, ants are not specifically leaf cutter ants. All ants are um, the most, they're the second most complex animal society on earth. They, they're incredible. They are wonderful problem solvers. And there are scientists that look at ant colonies and look at how they can apply some of their problem solving to actually our you know, our world of, of humans. Um, we are animals, so we can learn a lot from other animals ourselves. So here's some photos of leafcutter ants when I was in Arizona. This is the genus Atta. And I don't actually know what kind of plant they were farming here, but they were cutting lots of it down. You can even see their little bite marks in this picture. And different species of leafcutter ants will target um, either very a specific plant or maybe a few types of plants that they're, they know that they're going to bring those leaves back to their nest and they're going to grow a certain kind of fungus off of it and then they consume that fungus. And this is, this is a tropical nest that's been uncovered. I don't actually know the location of this photo. A friend in Texas sent it to me. It looks like it could be, it, it's definitely not even, I, I would think this is um, possibly Africa. Um, but look at the size of that. I mean, they go down deep. They've had to do some serious excavation to show just how elaborate and deep this nest is. And here's a photo of them actually in one of their fungal chambers consuming fungus. Um, this is a specific species of leaf cutter ant with their specific species of fungus that they eat. So one of the amazing adaptations of this group of ants is to, that has allowed survival in the desert is eating fungus. Who knew? We also have big headed ants. Um, these insects mainly feed on the, you know, they get protein from dead insects. That's a dominant, you know, thing that they're eating, but honeydew as well. Um, that is a, it's an insect um, excrement. So things like soft bodied insects, hemipterous insects like aphids or membracids suck plant juices and they poop out something called honeydew. And these, ants and many types of ants actually they'll farm insects that produce this type of excrement and then they eat it they consume it and it allows them to gain energy from those plants in almost an indirect way it's, they're almost cheating the system and it's quite an advanced adaptation of these ants that allows them to get plant-based food in kind of an untraditional way they have livestock they literally um, here, this shows the big headed ant worker and some of the other worker casts here of Fidoli is the genus. We're going through the big headed ants. Um, but here's a, here's a photo of them actually I, I took on prickly pear cactus. Uh, this was on the front range in Colorado and they're farming membracid larvae. So this is a type of hemipterous insect that this ant, these ants here are, are tending. They're making sure that they're protected because these ants these ants need a substance that this insect um, poops out and it allows for them to get nutrients they need and mainly uh, carbohydrates. 
So here's another photo. It's a different um, type of membracid, but um, I thought that was interesting, just kind of showing that ant guarding that, um, that hemiptrous insect, um, waiting for it to, to poop. <laughs> We've, we've got another group of ants here. We've got arid ants, um, arid lands, honey ants or honey pot ants is another term for them. And they're, ants in general are some of the, they, they run the desert. Ants are some of the most important insects in the desert. They are the main pollinator of cacti mainly. Um, honey pot ants have a very interesting biology. So they mainly feed on honeydew, just like our big headed ants do. and they, they do this so efficiently that they end up with a large source of this honeydew and they have actually had a whole cast of workers that we call repletes that go to the deepest chamber in the nest and they actually become what we call a honey pot where they store large copious amounts of that honeydew and they store it in their abdomens. And this is so that they don't lose the substance. It allows for them to essentially feed the colony over a longer period of time because they can keep those substances in their abdomens. And so this photo shows you a honey pot ant, and this is one of the repletes on the left that's full of honey. So it's not actually honey, it's honey dew. So it's insect poop, but it's phenomenal. I mean, in chambers of the ant colony, these ants will, they're pretty much like a it's a little buffet there and ants are allowed to come. And when they need those carbohydrates, they're able to obtain them from one of the replete workers that that's their job is to provide that substance to keep the colony going. We also have desert seed harvesters and they're an amazing group. They, they play an incredible role in the desert of helping to actually, they plant the desert, if you will. And it's a little indirect that this happens, but their seed harvesting not only allows for their survival, but it allows for the survival of the desert. So here you can see various seed harvesters harvesting seeds, which they'll cache in a pantry of their nest. And so during floods, nests can collapse, and then those seeds get moved around the desert to new areas and new plants bloom. And they help, they're, they're gardeners in the desert, we like to call them, but deserts run on ants. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have quite the same deserts that we have without them. Now I'm gonna move into wasps of the desert. We've got ma many hunting wasps that we're gonna go through today in the family Spessidae, Cabronidae, and Pompilidae. So hunting wasps have many habits. Um, these are solitary wasps. They do not have a colony structure, so they're pretty much on their own, even though you may see them using the same habitat. They're pretty much loners out there doing their thing. Um, these nests that they maintain are just for rearing their young. Um, they're dug into soil. Sometimes plant stems are used, sometimes mud. Um, they are very, they're pros at ex excavating uh, cavities that they are allowed, um, that allows them to grow their young. And the adults can sting and many of them are not aggressive. They have a task at hand and they're busy and in, you have to be in a really unfortunate way to to get stung, even though if you did, it'd be quite painful. So family Pompilidae, so the spider wasps, we've got many types of spider wasps. They're typically very dark in color and you'll see them in very arid areas searching for their prey, which is often, you know, it's for this whole group, it's spiders that they predate on. And their larvae feed on those spiders. Once those spiders are paralyzed by the adult's venom, those spiders are dragged down into an earthen chamber and then a larvae is laid on outside of that tarantula, if you will, or a spider. And then that young wasp is able to grow to maturity and the cycle repeats. We've got tarantula hawks. This is the famous one from this group. There's a few genera in here, but you can see in that lower right photo that we've got pepsis. That's the genus of the wasp dragging her prey down into her burrow. And soon she'll lay an egg on that paralyzed spider that the spiders can live for weeks they just kind of sit in paralysis while something consumes them so not a great way to go but these wasps have phenomenal biology and here you can observe the adult drinking nectar from one of our native milkweed species we've got a, another group um specid wasps there this is a very large group and they're easily recognized by that very pinched waist that's that um 
that abdomen is quite long and it, it allows for easy identification in the field and it allows for them to swivel around and manipulate prey and um, in mating that it allows them to, to do their thing. And uh, their larvae, so these, these baby wasps, they feed on paralyzed arthropods. So it can be more general. Um, many, many types of prey items there, we'll go through several. Um, some include spiders, very few. Uh, many predate on grasshoppers and caterpillars. So those are their big prey items. Here we have a mothla. This is a wasp digging her nest where she'll likely cache her prey. And she later brought back a sphinx moth and she brought it down into her chamber and likely laid an egg on it. The adults mainly feed on nectar. That's how they sustain themselves. And it's mainly food for their, their babies that they're bringing back to their nests. There's a little bit better of a picture. And you can see those wonderful mandibles that that insect has for grabbing prey off plants. I mean, caterpillars aren't easy to knock off plants. They've got a lot of adaptations themselves for staying on plants. So it takes, takes some serious muscle, if you will, or mandibles to do that. Here's another, um, you know, Amophila gathering nectar, keep her energy up, make sure she can find prey. Another species here on a desert plant. And some more. Here's Bembix, this is a sand wasp actually digging a horse fly down into her nest. This is a wonderful one. The golden digger wasp, I for the first time collected this insect last summer um, and they're predators of grasshoppers or katydids. Here's this individual in front of her nest, her single celled nest. And this would be a type of prey item she might drag down there. Likely it'd be maybe a nymph. It would be something smaller than this, but this is the species that they predate on. Oh, and we've got the steel blue cricket hunters and these wasps just search for crickets and then they go down. And this is, this is a picture taken from my area here in Grand Junction. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful photo. Those, those wasps are, are gorgeous, deep color, blue, a metallic, almost like a sapphire. And then a famous one, the cicada killing wasps. We, we mainly see this individual on the, the, the front range area of Colorado. They, they hunt cicadas if you can believe it or not, they drag the largest species of cicadas down into their nest and lay an egg on the exterior of that cicada and their, their babies grow up and the cycle repeats. Got lots of types of sand wasps in this group. Um, I like this photo here. You can see that, you know, that grain of sand that individual wasp is excavating um, for its prey. Here's a photo here, and I'm not sure if you can see my cursor here. Hopefully you can, but this that I'm circling around is their prey. It's right below the insect's abdomen. And this individual, you may say, well, where's that hole doesn't look very well dug. And it, she's actually has, she's dug this hole to her nest and then she's reburied it. So no one steals anything from it. So she's redigging it so that she can place this prey item in there. No, they'll, they'll stash many prey items. It's fascinating. Different species will store, um, many types of prey items or just one type. Here's another shot of this sand wasp here. And in this photo, you can see her actually bringing down a stink bug nymph into her nest. We've got many paper wasps in Colorado that are native. We have the pesky, um, you know, we've got the, the nuisance invader from the European paper wasp that we deal with. They're quite an invasive species, but we also, we've got good, Got good paper wasps too, and it's important to remember that they're important desert insects. You know, they feed on wasp larvae. They feed um, they feed many of their insects pretty much a chewed up. We like to call it a burger, a bug burger. Um, it's a little bit of an interesting way that they feed their larvae. We've got tefiidae, and these these males have this up curved segment of the abdomen that really allows for their identification and they're they're wonderful pollinators pretty unique to see those it's not all the time that you'll see this group either the scaliid wasps these are really robust hairy wasps can be very beautifully colored um and they're pretty much like every other solitary wasp um the only social wasp i really talked to you about today was those native paper wasps 
The last group of wasps I'm going to go through is the velvet ants. So they're, they're actually not ants at all. So they're wasps and the females are wingless. So it can become really confusing to actually identify them. And when they were described to science, it caused a lot of um, issues to arise in terms of, you know, they didn't really know um, <laughs> what they were. And the males are winged, which is where some of where the confusion comes in, but that sexual dimorphism caused the taxonomist a bit of headache. Um, but these are wonderful insects. This is a common species we see. This is a, a winged male in the Dazimutilla genus. And this is also Dazimutilla, but this is a female. And you can see how this looks quite like an ant, um, but it's not, it's, a, it's very much a wasp. Um, we've got several species that occur. I couldn't even begin to touch on all of the diversity that this group has but there's many types of wonderful velvet ants. Um, some people call them cow killers. Their stinger is pretty small, but packs a punch. And I just learned about this species I had to share with you. Um, these larvae are ectoparasites on sand wasp larvae. So we just learned about sand wasps and those larvae growing on certain prey items. And this is an insect that goes in and actually um, will predate on those sand wasps. Um, and yeah, Dazimutula, that species named Gloriosa, they named that one appropriately. That's a beautiful insect. All right, switching gears here, we're gonna go to the order Orthoptera or the straight wings. That's what that translates in from Latin. And this is a whole group of insects of the grasshoppers, the locusts, the crickets, um, and closely related insects. So we'll be going through some of those today that are famous in our desert ecosystems. So we've got the, the plains lover grasshopper. This is our largest grasshopper species in the state of Colorado. They're chunky. And we've also, we're switching you know, to the katydids. This is a famous one down in, in the Texas area. Um, so maybe the Chihuahuan desert. Um, this is a carniv carnivorous insect. So this thing will eat what it can take down. Um, they, I'm not afraid of a lot of insects, but this thing, it sure tries to make me afraid. I don't know if it quite has gotten me yet, but they can be quite intense in some of their behavior. So not only are they intense that they can eat vertebrates like frogs and lizards and mice, anything they can overpower, um, but this thing's quite intimidating looking. Um, I think they're just gorgeous insects that have wonderful adaptations, but it's almost alien-like. Um, it has, you know, and some insects have evolved for almost 400 million years, so they can get weird, but it's the, de it's the defensive posture of this insect that can really, it can make you freak out a little bit. Um, they throw their arms up in the air and they can even chase you, I've heard um, from some friends that are studying down in Texas, um, but they take a fighting pose and they, you know, their mandibles open up and they can be, can be really something to see. It's something I, uh, I'd love to see again. Um, Next, we'll go into some cricket groups. Um, so crickets can just be, they're wonderful. The ones that we find in deserts can be associated with caves or hollowed out trees underneath logs and stones, dark moist places. Um, many of them have long antennae. Some have um, pretty much the, the ability to jump many feet. That's an adaptation they have in their back legs. Um, this is a wonderful type of cricket here. It's a, it's a photo um, showing our cave or camel cricket group. And we call them camel crickets. As you can kind of see here, there's this hump-like um, shape that the crickets take. And that's why they are called camel crickets. We've got Jerusalem crickets as well. These are, um, they're a wonderful group. Um, people will turn them in and they're like little tanks of the desert. These things are chunky as well. And you can see those, um, those spines allow for digging in that insect group. These are quite large insects. They are larger than an inch. Here's an exposed, you know, tunnel of what one of those looks like, the Jerusalem cricket. Then we've got mole crickets. And I mean, look how sweet that is, this face. Um, but they are fairly large burrowing orthopterans. They, the males do sing like many crickets. Um, and I just find them to be 
they're so wonderful. I would like to find more of them um, just to observe some of their behavior. But you can see how those front pair of legs are modified with spines for digging. It's really, it's beneficial to this insect to have that, to escape the heat of the desert. That's an important adaptation for them to have. Here's another photo of them. They're like little teddy bears and they're, they sing. I mean, it doesn't get sweeter than that. We've got the Mormon cricket here. Um, they feed in sagebrush or, you know, in certain pine, pine systems with lupines and other forbs. Um, this is one of the, the forms that are green. Um, they're sometimes green, but they can be very dark green or brown. This was one of the more um, the rare um, phenotypes that you see in this group. Now we'll move on to Coleoptera. So beetles, we've got a few of these to get through, but we've got many types of beetles in the desert. I can only touch on some. Um, it was it was profound to me while making this PowerPoint, just how much there is in the desert. You know, you don't really think about it. And, um, or I guess not, maybe not the normal person thinks about everything in the desert, but there's amazing biodiversity in, in every way, birds, reptiles, and we're talking about insects today, but the plants, um, this is just a wonderful ecosystem on earth. And we're so grateful. Um, I'm so grateful that we can be close to, to deserts where we live here. So we'll talk about scarab beetles. This is a really big group. Um, some of these beetles will feed on dung. Some of them will feed on decomposing matter like carrion. Um, some feed on just humus and the soil, decaying vegetative matter, um, wood, fungus, seeds. They're very broad. So there is a lot of diversity in this group. We've got the June beetles. These were all over in Arizona when I went. Um, they're quite a large insect. Um, they're pretty silly flyers. They're pretty clumsy. And then there's the jewel beetle group. Um, I included a photo of this one. It's pretty poor. I apologize. It's so blurry. Um, but this is the jewel scarab. We did find this in Arizona and they were just starting to come out in early August when we were there last. They're gorgeous. There's another one that's green, but they don't have that silvery metallic streaking through it. Then we've got dung beetles and these insects primarily feed on dung. Here's a more beautiful dung beetle, if you will. This is the rainbow scarab or dung beetle. And we've also got the ironclad group. And these beetles are one tough insect. Um, not only I think that it's interesting that they feed primarily on fungi, um, these things are practically impossible to crush. They're, the way that their exoskeleton is built is the way they tuck everything in. I mean, I wonder if you could even run over them with a car. I mean, these things are tough insects, um, like blue death veining beetles are in this, in this group. I'm gonna go through some blister beetles now. This is the family Meloidae. Got a lot of species in Northern America, over 400, and they can be very colorful. Um, they're somewhat leathery in their appearance because they've got hairs, um, but it's almost velvet-like. Um, and their larvae feed mainly on grass, grasshopper eggs. Yes. And um, I mean, grasshoppers are cool, but many of them can be pesty. Um, many of them not though. Um, a few of the larvae of the blister beetle group will also um, find certain genuses of bees like Anthrophora, and they'll actually attack bee larvae as well. So native bees. So this is, um, this is one I found on scarlet globe mallow. You can kind of see that leathery appearance there in, in this photo but you see many types of, of blister beetles. This is a pretty common one, I would say. You see a lot of the black ones. Some of them actually, um, they store um, cantharidin in their abdomens and they, um, that cantharidin can actually cause blistering. Um, I left my tent open in Arizona and um, yeah, I suffered the effects of that. It was quite intense, um, but your skin pretty much can just melt away. It wasn't as maybe as intense as it sounds, but you're, it was really, um, it was an experience. Um, here's a, one of them on, on Yarrow. This one I found so beautiful. It was on, um, so this is a genus Zontis. And this was on curly cup gum weed, which is a common flower in the desert. This is a pyrota species. Um, I found the, the coloration on that beetle very beautiful. Here's a, a little bit of a different angle. 
So now we've got um, cantharid beetles. Um, these are soft bodied, pretty elongate beetles. Um, their head really protrudes forward. They're found on flowers commonly, so they're one that's easy to observe. Um, these insects also have cantharidin in their bodies. This, is, can, this can be pretty bad tasting to other predators. Um, they move between plants. They can serve as a role as a pollinator. And they're, they're great predators. I mean, this, is, this insect is, um, it'll arrive in the fall here in Colorado and it's a signal to me that fall is coming um, when this insect shows up. The, yeah, the, uh, the leather wings are a very interesting group, typically very black and, and yellow or orange, I mean. Um, the goldenrod soldier beetle, this is another species that's very black and orange. Um, the ones in Arizona were red. I thought they were just gorgeous. This is a common beetle um, in late summer in Arizona. And look, I think I got four mating pairs in that picture. That was a, that was a lucky shot, I think. Um, I wish I knew the plant they were on. It was, it was common in the canyon that we were in. Um, here's a, one of them unfortunately getting eaten by a predaceous hemiptera. these are one of the bee assassins and the Regiviidae group. Um, they've got those piercing sucking mouth parts and these soft body beetles make good lunch. So we've got agave weevil. So switching families now from Meloidae to the, the weevil family, Curculonidae. And these are associated with the uh, uh, agave family. They've got that really long nose. And at the end, they've got chewing mouth parts that allow them to um, breed within agave plants. We've got the family Lycidae. I'm not going to go too much into this group, but I just found them to be gorgeous beetles. Here's a different angle of it on Apuncia cacti. We've got tiger beetles. The tiger beetles are, they're a wonderful group. They're voracious predators as adults and as larvae. They're quite hard to catch. They're very fast. Um, I'm going to go briefly through these species here. These are ones mainly found in the Colorado desert areas. Yeah, they're associated with salt flats or playas um, in desert systems. They, and you'll, I'll show you why in a second, because their larvae um, are pretty much sand predators. And so are the adults. Um, you'll find the adults in more than just sand, but they typically seem to like that um, system. I didn't take this photo, but this, this insect we found at Caballo Lake State Park and they were all over the sandy beaches. And it, it was just, it was a wonderful sight to see if you ever get down to Caballo Lake. I thought this one was very beautiful and it's aptly named that color. They're gorgeous. Um, they're, like I said, they're very fast. So um, they, they haunt many entomologists because many of them get away from us. It's not a bad thing, I guess, but um, their larvae are alien looking. Um, they essentially dig a pit and they've got these hooks on a segment of one of their you know, abdominal segments that allow them to pretty much position themselves vertically. And you can see how this, this head casing here um, blends in and they, they're able to eat many things this way. Um, yeah, they've got that wide head that sclerotized those jaws for grabbing. Um, and they, they hide well in the sand and they probably eat pretty well. All right, moving on, we're gonna switch orders. So we're gonna go into the Megaloptera order. So we're gonna go over Dobson flies. And um, these are wonderful predators as aquatic larvae. They live, um, uh, Corydlus texanus, actually the larvae live in the Colorado River. They're very diverse in other areas of the world, but we've got one, one species that we commonly find here. And this was light trapped, as, as you show, you know, I showed you that photo before about light trapping. And we actually did catch a male with those really long mandibles. Um, yeah, that, that was um, outside of Moab, Utah. So now snake flies. Snake flies are a wonderful insect associated with many conifers. Um, California has a lot of them. We've got a fair amount here. Um, but they're cosmopolitan. They're worldwide. And aptly named as well. They've got that long head and thorax um, that makes them look a bit like a snake. They're not a true fly. They're, they're a separate group, but um, 
they're quite wonderful. And the, the larvae are predators of bark beetle on which we have many problems with in the state of Colorado. So these are real good, good insects. Now moving to another order, Neuroptera. Um, these are, they're wonderful insects. Um, the diversity in this order is, is outstanding. Um, we're gonna go through the ant lions first. Um, these can be very diverse and there's a very large species of them in the desert. Um, they're wonderful, voracious predators as larvae. They dig pits almost, it's a little different than tiger beetle larvae because they actually build that cone and they maintain that cone. So when things fall into it or are unfortunately stumble down into that pit, they get eaten by these very interesting larvae. And so ants, flies, anything crawling along the ground, they end up in that cone and at the bottom of it, they're gonna get pretty much, it's impending doom for them. Um, they're gonna be lunch. Um, this is one I exposed from one of those sand pits and you can see those really large mandibles and just how easily they're able to grab things. It's, it's a super advantage that they have. This is, um, a, it's artwork of the adult. I thought it was really beautiful. It showed you that they can have painted wings. Um, this is one of the species that you'll find very commonly. If you were to light trap in Arizona in the late summer, you'd find them in the cajillions. They're a very, they're a more primitive group. They're, um, they're quite wonderful. Maybe could be mistaken as a dragonfly. I could see that. Um, we've also got owl flies. This is another um, wonderful group. Um, they, they look like a butterfly met a dragonfly, and this would be what you get. Um, though they're very different, they're. Um, they're flying insects and I, we saw a wonderful diversity in Arizona when we were there. Um, oops, wrong way, sorry. Um, this is a, a gorgeous photo. Um, that photo on the right shows you the position that they hang on to plants too. They really commonly fold their wings down and their abdomens stick out. But you can see here on the left, just how, how colorful. It was hard to even choose a species, but those clubbed antennae, they've got a really big, club on the end of that helps with identification of this group. And look at those eyes. Um, those eyes, I don't have words for how interesting that is to me. I find that wonderfully fascinating. They have great eyesight. Um, and that's what their larvae looks like. So they're, they're predators as larvae. And um, you can see how they're maybe related to those ant lions those long voracious mandibles that are barbed. I mean, good luck getting out of the jaws of that thing. Then we've got mantid flies and these are, these are wonderful. They can be dragonfly like in appearance and they've got those raptorial arms. So really similar to mantids in that way but a totally different group of insects. They're active predators and they, they mimic social wasps. I, found, I find that really interesting. I've also heard someone call them dragonfly like as well. But they're beautiful insects. I mean, you can just see that how efficient those front arms must be for grabbing prey. Just like, just like that, there's lunch. Now we'll move into arachnids and we'll talk about several of these different groups here, but arachnids make up um, a large diversity of arthropods. They're not insects, um, but we'll go, oops, we'll go into um, the sulfugid family. So as you can see in that middle picture, that very odd behavior that that arthropod is displaying. Um, but these are eight-legged. They Normally when someone finds one of these, they call me and say, I have an alien in, in my bathroom. Um, but they're wonderful and they fluoresce just like scorpions do. Um, so if you're ever out hunting at night, you may find one of these and think it's a scorpion, but it's tailless. It doesn't, doesn't have a tail like a typical scorpion. So this is one of the relatives. There's you can sh many people see that and don't don't quite know what to think, but they are wonderful insects and they're important predators. Um, we've got many associated with the Colorado National Monument here in in Grand Junction. Different species. Now we'll move into scorpions. Um, Hollywood's made a lot of money on making scorpions very scary and other insects, um, but. 
they're really, there's a few that are dangerous, but in our area, we're, we're pretty lucky. We don't really have very venomous scorpions. Um, they should be observed and they should be, you know, we should give them credit. Many of them just hurt about as much as, as a bee sting. Um, you're not going to end up in the hospital necessarily in our area. Um, but it's important to know what species are in your area. So if you're going to go out and lift up rocks, just making sure that you're being careful. Yeah, scorpion anatomy is it's quite fascinating. Um, so they've got those four pair of legs because they're an arachnid, but then they've got modified mouth parts for grabbing their prey, their pedipalps. And then chelicera, it allows them to pretty much mash up and la lacerate up insect food and digest it. We've got a few different species. I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly just because I've got to get through the rest of my slides here pretty promptly. So we've got the hairy scorpion, We've got the black clawed scorpion. And I think it's important when you're collecting scorpions, you should, you should go out at night, use a black light and see what you find. Um, there's other reptiles, this was just, this is pretty new to science actually, um, that also fluoresce. Um, and bioluminescence is very interesting in the animal world, but it's the production and the emission of light by a living organism. And we don't necessarily even know why some arthropods have bioluminescence. Um, fireflies use it for mating. Um, so if you've seen a firefly, you've seen an insect or animal expressing bioluminescence. Um, but there's a few other arachnids in the desert before I wanna move on to cacti insects. And this is a vinegaroon. This is another arachnid that can give you quite a fright if you're not sure about what they're gonna do. Um, but they're, they're very interesting. They, they do have the ability to spray um, acetic and caprylic acid as a defense. Um, same here, they've got those four legs and then they've got modified mouth parts. And they're great mothers. They carry around their young and they even let their young hatch and then they carry them around still. They, we should be celebrating them on Mother's Day. They're quite a wonderful arthropod. We've got pseudo scorpions. These are really tiny. Um, some people call them book scorpions. And here's some of their anatomy. These would be normally quite small um, and may, they're really common. They just go unnoticed. Here's a comparison between a pseudo scorpion and a real scorpion, I guess. And here is a pretty blurry picture of one. I didn't have a great photo of this one. But you can see here, even this one's carrying around her eggs. So also a great mother. Now we'll move into cactus insects. Um, there's many types of insects. Some of them are more pesty. Um, I, I plan to go through just a few, um, but in our landscape, when we are growing native cacti, we can, can see many different things. So the cactus um, or a puncha bug is pretty common throughout the American Southwest. Um, they don't normally kill plants, but they're, it'd be shocking to me to come up upon any apuncha species and not really see them. Um, this is the adult, it's a hemiptrin. Um, there's probably two generations per year in Colorado and they've got, they're, they're probably on all of the apuncha because they're strong flyers, they fly around. Um, this is a nymph, so one of their young. This is the mating and here you can see that long mouth part that they use to, um, I'm pretty sure they just drink some of the apuncha juice and it's not, it doesn't kill the plant. Um, they're quite interesting to observe. This is a very young nymph. They have several nymphal stages. Here's a cluster of them on some blooming cacti. This is not a puncha, but they're, they're going for it. And then I'll spend a lot of the rest of the remaining time talking about cochineal scale. And this is a, a wonderful hemipterous insect that has some very interesting history I'd like to dive into. So cochineal scales are a soft scale. And when smush, they have this phenomenal color one of my favorite colors, maybe a magenta or a scarlet. And cochineal scale, it's mostly limited to a puncha species of cacti. And um, they're, they've got an interesting story. Um, so the Aztecs discovered them over 5,000 years ago, and 
they, they use cochineal for many different things, mainly a clothing dye or for art. Um, and it was discovered in 1519 in Mexico by some of the conquistadors um, from Spain. And when they were in a market that the Aztecs, um, they happened to stumble upon. And the Spanish um, essentially saw this bright red color, which in Europe at the time was really hard to produce. And they're like, this is it. We're gonna take this back to Europe. And that's where it became famous, even though the history really started here and the uses of it were from from many indigenous tribes here in the United States. Um, so some of their, some of the Aztec paintings, there's cochineal uh, scale dye used. Um, this is a, a young woman that is showing you the color of that cochineal scale. And then she's also got some clothing associated with the dye that's made from cochineal. There is another photo of that. But yes, it's, it's a wonderful, color and look at the array. Um, I'm not exactly sure how they get the different hues, but just a, it's a gorgeous insect with very interesting history. But these adult scales fill full of, of that um, substance that is used as dye. And it, it goes back in time. And so, so many cultures here, you see an individual that looks like maybe from Greece that was collecting this scale and using it. Um, but many of the famous paintings depict soldiers or um, famous people wearing, historically famous people wearing clothing that had to be dyed by cochineal scale. Here's some more examples of some, some artwork and textiles used. Some more here. Um, if you care to learn more about the history of this, this is a wonderful book. It's called The Perfect Red and it talks very heavily on the history of how, um, what it was like for early dye makers and finding certain colors. And um, I can't recommend it enough. It's a great book. Here's some colonies of cochineal scale. And their, their, life, their life history is fairly interesting. Um, they can be dispersed by the wind, but um, eggs are laid below a female. Scale insects are pretty simple. Um, they do have a crawler stage. Um, this shows some of their life cycle, but it's that adult female that's desired for dye production. And they've got this, you know, there's a few different species here. Um, the one that's commercially cultivated for dye um, is um, that caucus species. And here's some harvest occurring. You can see in that tin, she's got a lot of scale that she's collecting to make dye. Many of the Apuncha leaves are actually cut off and then um, they culture cochineal colonies from that and make dye. There's presses that have been used historically. I would love to see this in real life. I really need to plan a trip somewhere that this occurs um, and get some cochineal clothing. Um, but there's extracts made. Um, it's, it's quite an interesting process and historically valuable information to know that it came from the Aztecs and was made famous in Europe. Um, with that, I thank you for bearing with me at the beginning and through this, it was a little bit all over the place type of presentation, but I hope you learned lots about deserts in the Southwest. And um, I'd be happy to answer questions if you wanna stay late. I realize I'm at my time though. So thanks for bearing with me and I hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday.